Hi, my name is Aruna Surya and I'm here with Manfred Carrer, who founded BISC. BISC is a decentralized cryptocurrency exchange. In the previous video, we talked about Bitcoin transactions, uh, which uh, serves as a good background information for the current topic, for the today's topic, which is colored coins. So Manfred, what is a colored coin and how is it created? Yeah, a color coin is basically, technically it's the same as Bitcoin. You are just applying a different context uh, to special uh, transactions. And by that you can apply different rules, you can apply a different meaning to such a, a, a special Bitcoin. <coughs> uh, as we heard, as, as we discussed in the other video, uh, the security model for sending a few hundred Satoshi or for sending a few hundred Bitcoin is the same. So you get exactly the same security for sending very tiny amounts of Bitcoin. And you can use this for writing on the transactional system, on the secure transaction system of Bitcoin, for using it for transferring different type of value. Not the monetary Bitcoin value, but maybe something like a share, like a physical asset, whatever you want to uh, create, an alternative currency. Uh, and uh, it's a very old concept. It has been around for quite a long time. And the very first concept or implementation was to just use uh, the transaction output and the flow of the transaction outputs as the core principle to define that this is a color coin. And it starts usually with a Genesis transaction. So I create one special normal Bitcoin transaction where I say, okay, I put in here, I use some Bitcoin, whatever one Bitcoin is input, and send out a hundred different outputs to maybe the contributors in a project like we do with BSQ. Mm -hmm. So the BSQ, uh, BSQ uh, Genesis transaction, it used two and a half Bitcoin from what we received on our donation address as the input. And we are distributing that to all the past contributors. So we are creating just a normal Bitcoin transaction and we are defining in our context in the BSQ system, this transaction is our Genesis transaction and all these outputs are valid BSQ. Technically they are Bitcoin, but the, all the stakeholders of BSQ and the contributors are interpreting this Satoshis as BSQ and the monetary value of this BSQ have to be uh, should be higher like the underlying Bitcoin value. It cannot be lower because you still can use it as Bitcoin. So when you receive some um, BSQ uh, from this Genesis transaction, it's something like uh, 0 0.01 Bitcoin as a Bitcoin value. It can never be lower like this Bitcoin value. But we can say, uh, yeah, we can define uh, what's the unit for this color coin. And in the case of BSQ, it's 100 Satoshi is one BSQ. And whatever will be the market value of uh, one BSQ, let's assume it's something like uh, $1. Then uh, this 100 Satoshi uh, in Bitcoin value is much, much lower like $1. So we can transfer, we can use the carrier of Bitcoin to transfer a bigger value uh, in this form of a color coin. I'm getting a little bit too lost already in BSQ, sorry. Uh, but uh, So just, just to, uh, maybe it would be a good idea to talk about color coins in general uh, yeah. in this video. And uh, just to go back to the, to the question, if I understand, understand you correctly. So a color coin is, a typical, is an ordinary Bitcoin transaction, uh, but it has some extra context that um, specifies that specifies certain features about that, exactly. that transaction yeah. and that context where is it um, where is that information is it on the bitcoin blockchain or is it on the um, somewhere else for instance as you mentioned in bsq in the case of bsq it's somewhere outside bitcoin blockchain yeah it's uh, basically it's uh, it's outside so it's uh, those who are using this color coins, they are agreeing to a certain new rule set, which is on top of the Bitcoin rule set. So we cannot create an invalid Bitcoin transaction. We cannot spend more output like we use as input, for instance, that would be invalid as well as a color coin. It has to be at least a valid Bitcoin transaction. 
but on top of that, we can apply different rules. Like for instance, saying it has to be the origin in this special Genesis transaction, otherwise it's not the valid color coin. And uh, in practice, or uh, also historically, they are developed. Uh, they develop different types of color coins, and they use them. Are operate, yeah, as we discussed also in the other video, you can store additional non-transactional data in the op return output. <coughs> uh, and you can use this data for encoding some new transaction rules or transaction systems. And that was then mainly used by more advanced color coin systems like Mastercoin, Counterparty, Kulu. Uh, they become much more complex and they had the main problem that they need to store a lot of extra data on the Bitcoin blockchain. That was a lot of controversial uh, discussions about this. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I want to focus on this very simple and very basic concept that you're only following the transaction outputs to a Genesis transaction. This is the basic rule for a color coin because that's also what we use in BSQ and which is much more robust and we are not using their data storage capability of Bitcoin and avoiding this uh, controversial uh, discussion. So, <clears throat> so the uh, in order to create a colored coin, you need to follow all the rules of the Bitcoin blockchain uh, of the transactions and uh, create some other extra rules that are not specifically on the blockchain itself, but somewhere else. Exactly. And you mentioned that uh, it's created through Genesis transaction. Is this a typical way to create a colored coin? Yeah, uh, I'm not aware of any other solution. Maybe if somebody come up with another idea someday, but that's the typical way to do it. And can you elaborate a little more on the Genesis transaction? It's just a, a completely normal transaction and it's just be defined in this new context. Like we say, okay, we agree that we want to create and we are basically using this special color coin and we agree on a new rule set. And the very basic rule set is to uh, have the origin in this Genesis transaction. That's already enough basically to have a color coin system. Then we say all the outputs of these transactions are color coins. We are following the outputs and technically it's a little bit more complex because there are a little bit problems uh, by implementing it. But from conceptually, it's basically enough to say that it, everything else is normal Bitcoin rule. The only additional rule is it has to have an origin in the, in the Genesis transaction. Then it's uh, considered as this special color coin, what we define. And these rules are available somewhere uh, in another script that's shared with other people who are participating in this. Exactly. It's, it's it, right. basically in your software, what you are building on top of this color coin, the wallets, whatever, <clears throat> it will contain this extra rule. It's not part of the Bitcoin system. Bitcoin doesn't know about the color coins, basically. Uh, they, yeah, uh, they are, we, yeah, we are piggybacking on, on top of the Bitcoin transaction system and we are additionally applying some different contextual rule set which is only valid in our group, in our system, and only if those people who are using the color coin are accepting and following these rules, then yeah, they're agreeing to it. Otherwise, yeah, it's not valid for them. <laughs> when they say, no, no, I don't want to follow this rule, then they don't use it, basically. It's like Bitcoin. When somebody wants to use Bitcoin with a higher block size, then it's not Bitcoin, then it's Bitcoin Cash or whatever. It's a different coin. And from the Genesis transaction on, all the other transactions uh, are considered colored coins as well. Yeah, so like in this example, when we say all the outputs of the Genesis are color coins, <coughs> of our type, also color coin is a general term, but let's say it's the whatever, the, the Aruna coin. And uh, all, yeah, when you send me from this Genesis some Aruna coins and I send it to somebody else, then this other person is then the owner of the Aruna coins. And I, when I have spent it, I'm not the owner anymore. It's just the, exactly the same transactional rules like in Bitcoin. You are, by creating a new transaction, you are giving away the control over your coin to somebody else. And uh, in that context, we say it's, uh, it's still Bitcoin. And that's the important uh, part to consider. When, and yeah, it only makes sense when the value of this uh, 
or let's say it that way, we are using a very tiny amounts for this color coin units because otherwise it becomes very expensive. <clears throat> when we would say we, uh, we are sending our, some unit which has a real life value of $1 and we're using one, the unit of one Bitcoin, then it becomes super expensive to send one, the unit of $1 to somebody else. I need to take one Bitcoin as a carrier. So we're doing the opposite. We are taking a very, very tiny amount of Bitcoin. Let's say we are using 1000 Satoshi as the unit for one color coin of one, one Aruna coin is represented as 1000 Satoshi. And I can send to somebody else 1000 Satoshi and it costs me some Bitcoin. I need to have this Bitcoin for sending this. But 1000 Satoshi is something like 0.01 dollar cent, nearly nothing. But maybe a runa coin is the value of one gram of gold or whatever we attach as a value. It's a, it's a share of a company or whatever. So it has to be at least higher like this underlying Bitcoin value. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. And then we are, yeah, we are taking the Bitcoin system uh, as transactional system for transferring an asset which has a higher value as this underlying uh, value and it's not so different to the normal paper money when you have a paper bill it has some physical value the paper itself has some value and it costs something to print this money and like we see in venezuela people are using now the the venezuela uh, venezuelan uh, bills for for making clothes and backpacks because yeah it still has it's a good quality the paper and the the value of the paper is higher like the nominal value of the money because it crashed so badly. Uh, so you always have this very minimum carrier value and in the, in the uh, case of color coins is the underlying Bitcoin value of this few Satoshi, what you're sending. It cannot be below that, but usually of course you, you want to have it higher, otherwise uh, it's, it's basically broken. And are colored coins always created on top of the Bitcoin blockchain? It's always, uh, it's connected to the, the, the concept is connected to the Bitcoin blockchain? It can be done on any blockchain basically. Uh, and I'm probably, it exists for other blockchains as well. Uh, the basic concept is just that you use an existing blockchain uh, and piggybacking on this transactional system for representing something different like their original unit like the Bitcoin and you can yeah you could I mean people wanted to issue gold or units of gold there or shares or whatever and I mean there are a few color coin projects which got successful like a counterparty or master coin which is today Omni or the Tether for instance is uh, yeah is using Omni and uh, those are the more complex systems. They are not uh, this very simple uh, UTXO-based systems. They are encoding the transactions rules in op return data and some other data. Um, yeah. And do you need to specify all the rules in the Genesis transaction or can you change the rules later? Uh, it's like when you create a new coin or a new, yeah, new altcoin, basically you are defining the rules and people who are using it are agreeing to these rules. So it's not really defined in the Genesis. It's just the software, what they're using, they, in the software, it's basically hard coded, like in the Bitcoin software, it's hard coded that there is this Genesis transaction from Satoshi and everybody who use Bitcoin agree to this. And it's an arbitrary rule. So she said, okay, that's the first transaction. And yeah, that's uh, the basic rule. And with creating a new color coin, you are basically creating this Genesis transaction, defining this rule. Uh, but it's not a part in their, usually it's not their encode. I mean, you can, on top of that, you can use op return or some extra rules and, and try to encode some additional rules directly in the blockchain. But that's, not, that's optional and not really required for the basic, uh, very primitive and very uh, true system. Um, yeah. That's... Okay. And can colored coins be destroyed? Yeah. So usually when you are not following the rules correctly, and that becomes already now a little bit more complicated because for sending some Bitcoin to somebody else, you need also a mining fee. Without paying a miner fee, it will not be mined and will not be confirmed and added to a block. But you don't want to pay the mining fee with your color coins because the color coins, as you said, they have much more value. 
So when you have to pay whatever 10,000 Satoshi for the miner, you don't want to take uh, your Aruna coin because maybe one Aruna coin has the value of $1,000 and you don't want to spend $10,000 on mining fee. So you need to put, use some Bitcoin, so normal Bitcoin, not colored coins, additional as input and use that for paying the mining fee. And then you get a change output and you need to manage this and, uh, and define the rules that you can verify that uh, when you have a, such a color coin transaction, uh, you have, for instance, two inputs. One input is a Runa coin from some other, which has the origin in the Runa Genesis transaction. And the other input is a normal Bitcoin from your normal Bitcoin wallet. And then the output is you are sending me uh, whatever, five Aruna coins, that's maybe 50,000, uh, 5,000 Satoshi. And you get uh, maybe some change output back because you had a bigger input. And you have to pay the mining fee. And for the Bitcoin, what you use, you also usually don't have exactly the amount what you need to pay. So you have, you put in a bigger amount of Bitcoin and you get the change output. So in such a transaction, you would have one output where you send me the 5,000 uh, Satoshi as a Runa coin. Then you have another change output to yourself. Let's say it's 15,000 Satoshi, which goes back to yourself, uh, to an address of yourself. And then you have the change output for the Bitcoin, which is the leftover from the mining fee. Let's say you have put in uh, one Bitcoin as, my, uh, as the input and then uh, 0 0.999 Bitcoin is the change output and 0 0.001 is the mining fee or whatever uh, and yeah and then this rules has to be uh, interpreted correctly that you understand that for instance the first outputs are the runa coins and then the follow-up outputs are the bitcoins and when you would uh, create a transaction which doesn't fall this rules of this color coin concept or so, and that's arbitrarily defined by the color coin issuer as the one who implements this color coin can define how he designed these rules. And uh, when you make a transaction, which for instance has, a, when the rule is that the first outputs are interpreted as the Aruna coins and then the remaining are interpreted as uh, Bitcoin and you cannot spend more Aruna coins like you have as input from Aruna coins. So when you have an input with 20,000 Satoshi from Aruna coin, you cannot uh, spend 30,000 Satoshi Aruna coins and it becomes Bitcoin, because then it, it's not covered by the Aruna inputs. And by uh, doing such a transaction, when you would send me 30,000 Aruna coins to my address, you would basically destroy the 20,000 Aruna coins from your input because uh, it's invalid as Aruna in the system because you cannot spend 30,000 Aruna coins from an input of 20,000 uh, uh, 30, Satoshi from an input of 20,000 Satoshi. And by that, you would have destroyed it as a Runa coin, but it's still valid Bitcoin because in the Bitcoin system, it's still valid. Bitcoin only see you have 20,000 Satoshi input and you have uh, as long as the total sum of all the inputs and the total sum of all the outputs is correct, everything is fine. Bitcoin doesn't distinguish that one input was a color coin and the other input was a Bitcoin and that you have to take care that the output of the color coins is not higher like the inputs of the color coins. So this additional complexity and, and uh, uh, rules, which are part and only of the color coin system, Bitcoin is completely blind, doesn't know about this. Uh, but when you would uh, create a normal Bitcoin transaction, which breaks the rule of the color coin, but it's still a valid Bitcoin transaction, then you are basically destroying your color coin and you're burning it in a way, so they become uncolored, they become naked Bitcoin again. So I can still spend the 30,000 uh, Satoshi, or you can spend the 30,000 Satoshi or whoever received this, but it's instead of maybe $30,000, it's just whatever, 0 0.03 uh, dollar or cent. So it, you lost a lot of value. So if you do not follow the rules specified for uh, this particular color coin, uh, when you send it, then it's destroyed, uh, but it's not, uh, it's just con converted back into the Bitcoin and the receiver actually receives Bitcoin. Yeah, he always receives Bitcoin, but usually he doesn't use it as a Bitcoin <laughs> because he would be stupid. When I receive a value in a Runa coin, which represents $30,000, I will not spend it as a Bitcoin, which represents uh, three cents. 
that would be very stupid to do this. I, but technically, I could do this. Uh, but there's no motivation that I do this. I want to keep it in Aruna coin. And by uncoloring, by destroying it, when I make a transaction which invalidates this Aruna coins, then yeah, I'm back to the Bitcoin value. And uh, this money, basically, which has, you have put in an input of $30,000 when we assume that, that the value of the Saruna coins are, and the output is basically only Bitcoin and has very tiny Satoshi values. So if this uh, colored coin is destroyed, can you, uh, in the future, create more colored coins? Uh... Yeah, there are, it depends on the color coin system. <clears throat> But you can, for instance, define like in a Bitcoin system with every new block, new Bitcoin gets created. In the Bitcoin system, they create it out of thin air. In the color coin system, you cannot create new, yeah, new coins out of thin air uh, because then it would be invalid Bitcoin. <clears throat> but you can use uh, some Bitcoin input and can define that is a new Genesis transaction. So there's no need to say there's only one Genesis transaction. You can say, okay, there's one basic Genesis transaction like in Bitcoin, but then there are new issuance transactions like in Bitcoin, there are every block, there are re block reward uh, to the miners. And in the color coin system, you can do the same. You can say whatever for this and this event, what happened in our subsystem, uh, yeah, you are issuing new tokens and uh, and then the network ver uh, validates and verify that this is um, that the, the sp special external rules have been applied that it's valid to create this new uh, to define this new uh, issuance transaction and then additionally to the genesis outputs or uh, you have many more outputs because then you can say okay here is a new issuance transaction all the outputs of that new issuance transaction are as well color coins and by that you can increase the monetary supply and you are flexible with the um, yeah with creating new tokens so uh when you say it's, it needs to be validated uh it's, it needs to be validated by nodes that are running the software for, yeah. for this particular color coin it's again it's a completely <clears throat> external system to the Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't know about that this is an issuance transaction or a Genesis transaction. For Bitcoin, it's just a normal Bitcoin transaction. So when you are creating an issuance transaction for your color coin, then the users who are using your color coin in that software, there need to be some rules and some validation for this. Uh, and that's arbitrary rules that you are defining as the creator of your color coin, you are defining these rules and the people who are using it, they're following these rules. When they don't agree, they should not follow it. They should not use this coin. And the issuance transaction in this case is somewhat different from the issuance transaction in Bitcoin, right? Yeah, it's a little bit different because you, as I said, you cannot create coins out of thin air. That's possible in Bitcoin. But uh, because we are riding on top of Bitcoin, you cannot make a transaction where yeah, you have no input so, <coughs> for this transaction. So you always need to, when you are the issuer, let's say there are some special rules and you have uh, yeah you have uh, done some stuff and then the other can validate that you have fulfilled these rules like in the bitcoin case the miners they have to find a, a, a hash for with certain properties and then the network is validating that he has really found this hash and then by that he has the authority and has the right to issue new tokens and in a color coin system you can build something similar that are, yeah, you fulfilled some special rules and the others are validating that. And then you have the right to create new tokens. Let's say you have the right to create new uh, thousand uh, Aruna coins. And to create this transaction, you need to fund it with some Bitcoins because at the end it's a Bitcoin transaction. And that's a little bit of a difficult thing to understand that you create a Bitcoin transaction where you, let's say uh, Aruna coin is 1000 Satoshi to create one, thousand aruna coin it's one million satoshi so you take from your bitcoin wallet one million satoshi which is something like whatever one dollar or two or ten dollar and put as an input in this transaction and the output are aruna coins in your system only when you yeah when when it when you have fulfilled these rules which will be validated by the subsystem of the aruna coin users and by that, uh, you are basically like the central bank, you are printing new money. You have to pay for some basic costs, like the central bank have to pay for the paper of the 
bills of the dollar bills, it costs some money to print a dollar bill, but the printing costs are much lower, like the nominal cost of the dollar bill. Uh, and then you can issue this, and the people who are receiving this, they are just taking it as a, yeah, as a new unit of a, of, of a value and uh, using the Bitcoin system for transferring it. So apart from the Genesis transaction, anyone can create um, uh, colored coins through the issuance transaction as long as they follow the rules specified in this script and they uh, input a certain amount of Bitcoin that is equivalent to a certain amount of colored coins and that the colored coins will become the output? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's basically with the issuance, uh, the same like the creator of the color coin has basically the power to say, okay, that transaction, all the outputs are now color coin. And you can extend this to say, okay, when somebody fulfills a special requirement in the network, like a miner who is finding the POC and doing work for the system by securing it, then he gets a reward and he has the right to issue to himself new tokens. And you can use similar model like in a company, you are paying the employees in that way that you say, okay, when you have done this and this work, and we have whatever rules to verify this, uh, and then you have the right to issue your payment to yourself and you print whatever $10,000 in the in, as, uh, equivalent value for your work and you get a reward and get the motivation to go on working for the project. Great. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the uh, usage of colored coins? Uh, maybe in some examples like Tether, USD, and others. Yeah. I say I'm not a super specialist on color coins uh, from all this uh, <coughs> uh, details implementations like Kulu. Uh, Kulu, is a, Kulu is another uh, big um, color coin project. <coughs> uh, Counterparty and Omni or Mastercoin are another. And mainly they were... Uh, used for issuing uh, assets like, for instance, a gold coin or a share of the company or just another cryptocurrency or art like on, on a, a counterparty. There was this, uh, what was the name? Um, no, paper coin. As so a paper coin where yeah, you produce a piece of art or whatever, some images, and you are defining how much images exist. You can define, okay, there are 10,000 copies of this image. And then it's like on an art market, you can sell your image uh, to somebody else and they can speculate uh, based on that. That was quite popular. And on um, Ethereum, they did something similar, but a little bit more stupid with CryptoKitties. Uh, you can do all kinds of stuff. And I mean, a reason why ColorCoin doesn't have a very good reputation beside the reason that they abuse the blockchain space for storing their data. And there have been many Bitcoin developers who said that's very, uh, that's basically a, yeah, abuse of the of the data because everybody else needs to store this data and yeah that uh, has some issues. <clears throat> but beside that, another yeah to create something like CryptoKitties doesn't give a great reputation to the to the underlying system. So I mean maybe people yeah make jokes about it here because CryptoKitties is so big, and the same happened probably on the Bitcoin side with, yeah, with many accounts about there are millions of tokens and 99.99% are completely crap and stupid and uh, has no real life value. And there have not been really many successful projects which are really interesting or whatever. And, but that's not, that's not basically the mystic of the conceptual idea of a color coin. That's probably uh, people are trying to just make quick money and don't are don't create are not creating really interesting systems on top of it. And when you, uh, usually when you, they have, go ahead. No, no. Yeah, usually they have a centralization issue because yeah, when you're issuing gold coin, yeah, who is controlling that you really have the gold? And at the end, it doesn't really work very well in a really decentralized system when you want to connect it with physical assets and so on. So it's very hard problems to solve. Most people ignore this problem and just do it in a, in a shady way or in a in a stupid way at the end, and that's probably one reason why color coins are kind of like that, or not really. Most people are not really interested in this concept anymore. Uh, when you mentioned that everybody else has to store uh, all this information, uh, you mean everybody else, uh, all the Bitcoin nodes have to store? Yeah. Some extra so, uh, there is one kind of like recommended way to store extra data in the blockchain. 
So like time stamping, like we explained in the other video, when you want to put uh, a proof that something has happened at a certain time, uh, you can make, yeah, you can put a 20 byte hash into the blockchain and with that you have this proof that's very powerful and many Bitcoin developers like Peter Todd, he has implemented his own open timestamp system. So there's a lot of support for such system because they are very powerful and not creating a lot of damage. 20 bytes is really very little data. And But the color coin systems, which are, are more complex, uh, they which implement their own transactional system, uh, they need much more data space. They cannot store this data. Uh, this operator is very limited. It's only 80 bytes what you can store there. And they required much more data. And they did it in other ways you can uh, yeah, you can make you can trick the system in a way that you store some data, like in multi-sig transactions, and yeah, you can you can abuse the system in a way that you are storing, you are encoding some data in the blockchain, and uh, every every node, every full node has to store this data forever, and that's a burden on somebody. It's externalizing the cost, uh, which has a benefit for your system, but you're externalizing it to everybody. And um, something like the crypto kitties, they will be stored forever in the Ethereum blockchain and, and yeah, nobody needs this and uh, many people are not interested at all in this bullshit. And they, when you run a full node, you are, you are paying the costs at the end for this. So that's a, a main problem. And the only kind of like acceptable compromises to use op return for this, they are also treated in the transactional system of Bitcoin in a way that they are not uh, creating a lot of burden. They are still stored as data, but they are ignored for validating and, and many other things. Uh, it's a little bit more complex to go into details of this, but that's basically the kind of like recommended way to do it, which is acceptable. There are some hardcore people who even don't like this, but uh, Satoshi at least were supporting something like this because he was very interested in smart contracts and you cannot build more complex smart contract stuff without extending their existential existing script system and using something like uh, DOP return for building on top of this. Okay, uh, and now uh, I would like to ask a question about BSQ. Uh, a BSQ token, is it a colored coin? And if it is, how is it different from other colored coins? Maybe if you can talk about it uh, briefly, uh, and then we can talk about it in more detail in the next video dedicated yeah. to the BSQ token specifically. Yeah, BSQ is a color coin on Bitcoin. <clears throat> so technically it's just Bitcoin. <clears throat> and uh, it's different to the other uh, color coin concept in a way that it's even more simple and um, reduced like the first color coin concept. The f very first were based on this, just following the transaction outputs. And the basic rule is that a, a, a coin has to have an origin in, in a Genesis transaction. So we are not using uh, data on the blockchain to encode our transaction rules. Uh, the transaction rules are implemented in every BISC application and executed and validated there. The Bitcoin full nodes, they, for them it's just a naked Bitcoin transaction. The only thing what we are using is op return data for more complex stuff, but for a very basic transaction you also don't need the op return. Uh, but for the more complex stuff like voting and issuing uh, coins, uh, we need the op return, but also there we are using it only for timestamping, basically, for putting in a hash, a 20 byte hash usually. Uh, and yeah, the main difference is that we are not like Kulu or Mastercoin or um, Counterparty requiring more data to implement a more complex system. This more complex system has also security issues because it's, it's more vulnerable to bugs and problems when you build a basically a new transaction system on top of Bitcoin and use Bitcoin only as carrier for the data, as data storage at the end. Uh, yeah, uh, that's basically different to the existing systems. And the main motivation why I didn't want to build on top of them was because they didn't support all the features what we require. And the main feature was to have a decentralized issuance model and counterpart, for instance, you cannot build a system that all the counterparty nodes are verifying some special uh, rules that gives you as a contributor in BISC the authority to issue to yourself new tokens that you are paying yourself basically like a mine in Bitcoin. That was not possible there and that was a main requirement for the BSQ system. 
another problem was that uh, most of those, I didn't want to rely on third party technology and companies often like Hulu and MasterCoin has a very shady, very negative reputation history. Yeah, it was not very, yeah, it was not very, uh, it didn't really carry it away. It was very PR driven, very marketing driven and uh, I didn't, never liked it. So that was the main reason why we implemented our own system and to have it all in our control and define our own rules and be more flexible uh, by that. And we have our own peer-to-peer -peer system. We have our own application. Those other BISC application can do all this verification. And uh, yeah, Maybe we can talk about it in more detail in, mm -hmm. in the next video where we can cover all these uh, topics. And um, would you like to add anything else uh, about Color Coins in general? Uh, I think we covered probably, hopefully, everything. I mean, there's one uh, very interesting project uh, in research or maybe already in development that's called RGB, like the color, co uh, color code, as uh, so a red, bl uh, blue, green. And it's based on some yeah, research and ideas from Peter Todd. And uh, Chuck, Giacomo Tsuko uh, is the, the lead of developing and implementing this. I think it's still very early stages, so I'm not sure um, but that might bring a revival in the idea of color coins and maybe in some day when it's successful and when it's well implemented and um, robust um, we would would consider to move over to this system i think it will have probably some advantages over the current systems and ideas uh, but yeah so i there's still people who try to uh, yeah to um um, that's about to resurrect the, uh, the concept of color coins uh, and uh, yeah, it might be that we see a kind of like a revival of this idea and, and to see real more interesting applications like just to have another altcoin basically on top of Bitcoin like most coins are or much worse like cryptocurrencies. <laughs> okay, so then maybe I will try to summarize the main points of the colored coin uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, you can add anything that I may have missed. Uh, so a colored coin is basically a, an ordinary Bitcoin transaction output uh, that has extra rules uh, that are out, outside the Bitcoin blockchain. And so apart from the Bitcoin transaction rules that it needs to follow, it also needs to follow the specific rules that are re related to it. Uh, a colored coin is typically created through a Genesis transaction. So uh, a, gen a transaction is labeled as the Genesis transaction by uh, that script. And any transaction, any outputs that go from that transaction forward on uh, are considered colored coins. Uh, a colored coin, uh, as I mentioned, needs to follow all these rules. And if it doesn't, then it can be destroyed but the underlying value is still the Bitcoin value uh, that can be transferred to uh, a receiver and the Bitcoin network is not aware of, the, uh, of all these extra rules or all these happenings. And uh, also colored coin can be created through an issuance transaction where um, anyone who follows the specific rules can input Bitcoin and produce colored coins as outputs. Perfect. Very good summary. Thanks a lot. Great. Making it very clear. So, is there anything else that you would like to add, or shall we? I uh, think from my side we covered probably everything, and maybe go in more details. And when we talk about the BSQ token as one example of a color coin implementation, and of course everything which I explained here is a little bit with the background of, of BSQ as with Asian transaction. It's not so typical in other other color coin concepts, and it's arbitrary. So there when somebody has a new idea and do whatever it's basically you are as a creator of the color coin in the in the role of satoshi creating bitcoin you are defining the rules and and when nobody's following it, it yeah it has no value it has still the bitcoin value but not more uh, only when you find people who believe in this and follow the rules and execute this it becomes valuable great uh then we are going to uh end with this video, uh, with this uh, description. And uh, in the next video, we're going to talk about uh, BSQ specifically and uh, all the concepts related to BSQ uh, creation and 
burning, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. my friend. Bye. Bye. -bye.